I read you this document now, exactly as it was discovered. My name is Edward Eden, and I set this story down, not expecting it to be believed, but if possible, to prepare a way of escape for the next victim. Another, perhaps, may profit by my misfortune. My own case, I know, is hopeless, and I am now, in some measure, prepared to meet my fate. I was born at Trentham in Staffordshire, but I lost my mother when I was three years old and my father when I was five, and my uncle, George Eden, adopted me as his own son and brought me up in London. He was a single man, a journalist, and he educated me generously, fired my ambition to succeed in the world, and at his death he left me his entire fortune, a matter of about £500. Uncle George advised me in his will to expend this money in completing my education. Now, I had already chosen the profession of medicine, and through his posthumous generosity and my good fortune in a scholarship competition, I became a medical student at University College London. At the time that this story begins, I was lodging at 11A University Street in a shabby upper room overlooking the back of Schoolbred's Promises on, 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 on Tottenham Court Road. I used this little room both to live and to sleep in because I was anxious to eke out my inheritance to the last shillings worth. I was taking a pair of shoes to be mended at a shop round the corner when I first encountered the little yellow-faced old man with whom my life has become so inextricably entangled. He was standing on the curb, staring at the number of the door as I opened it. His eyes, though they were dull grey eyes and reddish under the rims, fell to my face, and his countenance immediately assumed an expression of corrugated amiability. "'You come up to the moment, Mr Eden,' he said. "'I had forgotten the number of your house. How are you?' I was a little surprised because I'd never set eyes on this man before, and I'm afraid that he rather noticed my lack of cordiality. Wonder who the deuce I am, eh? <laughs> a friend. Let me assure you of that. I, I, I've seen you before, although you haven't seen me. Now, is there anywhere that we can talk? Well, I hesitated. My room upstairs was not a matter for every stranger. Well, well, perhaps we might walk down the street, I said. I, I'm unfortunately prevented. No, 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 please, he interrupted. Look, 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 look here, Mr Eden, this business of mine is a rigmarole. Come and lunch with me. I, I, I'm an old man and it, it's a cold day and what with my piping voice and the, the clatter of traffic, he, he laid a, a skinny hand that trembled a little on my arm. Well, I, I was ready for lunch, it's true, but at the same time I wasn't altogether pleased by this abrupt invitation. And I'd rather, I began, but I had rather not, said the old man interrupting again. And a certain civility is surely due to my grey hairs, is it not? And so I consented. He took me to Blavitsky's and over... Such a lunch as I'd never tasted before in my life. He fended off my questions and I took notice of his appearance. His, his clean-shaven face was lean and wrinkled. His, his shriveled lips fell over a set of false teeth and his white hair was thin and rather long. He seemed very small, although most people seem small to me, it's true. And his shoulders were, were rounded and bent. And watching him, I, I, I couldn't help but observe that he was taking note of me too, running his eyes over me with a curious touch of greed in them. And now, he said as we lit our cigarettes, to the business in hand. I'm an old man. I'm a very old man. And it happens that I have money and never a child to leave it to. Well, I immediately suspected a confidence trick, and I resolved to be on the alert for the vestiges of my five hundred pounds. But he proceeded to enlarge upon his loneliness and the trouble that he had finding a proper disposition of his money. I, I've weighed this plan and that plan, uh, charities, 
institutions, scholarships, etc. And I've come to this conclusion at the last. And here he fixed his eyes on my face. That I will find some young fellow, ambitious, pure-minded and poor, healthy in body and healthy in mind, and in short, make him my heir. Give him all that I have so that he may be lifted out of all the trouble and struggles of youth to freedom and influence. Well, I try to seem disinterested. And, and you want my help, perhaps, my, my professional services to find that person, I asked. He smiled and looked at me over his cigarette, and I laughed at his quiet exposure of my modest pretense. What a career! Such a man might have, eh? he said. God, it fills me with envy to think how I have accumulated that another man might spend. But there are conditions, of course. Burdens must be imposed. You cannot expect everything without some return. Whoever inherits must, for instance, take my name. And I must go into all the circumstances of his life before I can accept him. I, I must know his heredity, how his grandparents and his parents died. I must make the strictest inquiries into his private morals. <laughs> and do I understand that I, you, Mr Eden, yes, you, my imagination began dancing wildly. But, but, but why me in particular, I said. Well, he had chanced to hear of me from Professor Hasler, he said, as a typically sound and sane young man, and he wished, as far as possible, to leave his money where health and integrity were assured. And that was my first meeting with the little old man. I mean, he was mysterious about himself. He wouldn't give me his name yet, he said. And after I'd answered some questions of his, he left me at the door to Blavitsky's. I, I noticed that he drew a handful of gold coins from his pocket to, to pay for our lunch. I mean, his insistence upon bodily health was curious. I mean, and in accordance with an agreement that we'd made over lunch, I applied that afternoon for a life policy in the Loyal Insurance Company for a large sum, and I was exhaustively overhauled by the medical advisers of that company in the subsequent week. I mean, that alone did not satisfy the old man, however, and he insisted that I must be re-examined by the great Dr Henderson. It was Friday in Whitson week before he came to a decision. He called me down. It was quite late in the evening, about nine o'clock. I was cramming chemical equations for my preliminary scientific examination, and I came down to find him standing in the passage under the feeble gas lamp, his face a grotesque interplay of shadows. He seemed more bowed than when I'd first seen him, and his cheeks had sunk a little. Everything is satisfactory, Mr Eden, he said. Everything is quite, quite satisfactory. And this night you must dine with me and celebrate your accession. <clears throat> he was interrupted by a cough. You, <laughs> you won't have long to wait either, I think, he said, wiping his handkerchief across his brow and gripping my hand with a long bony claw. No, no, not very long now at all, I think. We went into the street and he hailed a cab. God, and you see, I, I remember every incident of that drive vividly. You know, the swift, easy motion of the cab, the vivid contrast of gas and oil and electric light, the, the crowds of people, the, the place in Regent Street which we went and the sumptuous dinner that we ate there. I mean, I was disconcerted at first by the waiter's glances at my rough clothes, bothered by the, the stones in the olives, but as the champagne warms my blood, my confidence revived. At first, the, the old man talked of himself. Now, he'd already told me his name in the cab. He was Egbert Elversham, the great philosopher, a name that I'd known since I was a schoolboy. I mean, this it was absolutely extraordinary, incredible to me that, that, that this man, whose intelligence had so early dominated my own, this great abstraction should 
suddenly realise itself as this decrepit figure. I, I dare say that every young fellow who's suddenly fallen among celebrities has felt something of my disappointment. He told me now of the, the future that the feeble streams of his life would presently leave dry for me. Houses, copyrights, investments. I'd never imagined that a philosopher could be so rich. Hey, what a capacity for living you have, he laughed as he, he watched me eat and drink. And then he added with a sigh, it was a, a sigh of relief, I could have thought it. Hey, but it will not be long now. Ah, no, I said, my head swimming with champagne. I, I, I have a future, perhaps, of a passing agreeable sort, thanks to you, and I, I shall have the honour of your name, Mr. Elvisham, but you have a past, such such a past as is worth all my future. He shook his head and smiled. Ah, yeah, that future. <laughs> Would you in truth change it? I mean, you will not perhaps mind taking my name, to taking my position, but would you indeed willingly take my years? With your achievements, certainly, I said gallantly. He smiled again as the, the waiter brought us liqueurs. And then he turned his attention to a little paper packet that he'd taken out of his pocket. This hour, he said, this after-dinner hour is the hour of small things. Here is a scrap of my unpublished wisdom. He opened the packet with his shaking yellow fingers and he showed a little pinkish powder on the paper. This, he said. <laughs> no, well, you must guess yourself what this is. His large greyish eyes watched me with an inscrutable expression as he divided the powder between the, the two little liqueur glasses. Then rising suddenly and with a, a strange unexpected dignity, he held out his hand towards me. I imitated his action and our glasses rang. To a quick succession, he said, and raised his glass to his lips. Oh, no, 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 no. I said hastily, please, please, Mr. Elvisham, not that, please. He paused with the liqueur at the level of his chin and his eyes blazing into mine. To a long life, I said. He hesitated, then he let out a bark of laughter. <laughs> to a long life! <laughs> yes! I thank you, young man. To a long life. And with eyes fixed on one another, we drained our glasses. Now, the first touch of that drink set my brain in a tumult. Now, I, I seemed to feel an actual physical stirring in my skull and a seething humming filled my ears. I didn't notice the flavour in my mouth or the aroma that filled my throat. I saw only the grey intensity of Mr Elvisham's gaze that burnt into me. Now the draught, the, 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 the mental confusion, the noise and the stirring in my head seemed to last an interminable time. Curious vague impressions of half-forgotten things danced and vanished on the edge of my consciousness. But at last he broke the spell. And with a sudden explosive sigh, he put down his glass. Well, he said. Oh, it's glorious, I said. And I sat down clumsily. And then my perception grew suddenly clear and minute. And I saw things as, as though in a concave mirror. Mr. Elvisham's manner seemed to have changed, too, into something nervous and hasty. He pulled out his watch suddenly and grimaced. Oh, 11-7, and tonight I must Waterloo. I must go at once. He called for the bill and struggled with his coat, and in another moment I was wishing him good night over the apron of a cab with an absurd feeling as... I, I don't know how can... Well, it felt as if I not only saw, but felt through an inverted opera glass. That stuff, he said, I, I ought not to have given it to you, perhaps, young man. It will make your head split tomorrow. Here. He handed me a little flat thing, like a, a sidelets powder. 
Take that in water as you're going to bed. Not till you're ready to go to bed, mind you. It will clear your head. That is all. Now, one more handshake, young man. Futurus! I gripped his shriveled claw. Goodbye, he said. Goodbye, I answered. And with a whirling brain, I began my walk home through the Regent Street loiterers and the dark back streets beyond Portland Road. I remember the sensations of that walk very vividly. It, 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 it's hard to describe the, the peculiarity of my mental strangeness, the mental doubling, one might call it. Because as I was walking up Regent Street, I had the queer persuasion that I was in Waterloo Station. And I had an odd impulse to get into the Polytechnic, as a man might get into a train. I don't know how best to express it. I mean, well, you see a skilful actor sometimes, don't you, quietly looking at you. He pulls a grimace, and lo, he's another person. I mean, is it too extravagant if I were to say that it seemed as if Regent Street had for a moment done that to me? It had, it had pulled a grimace. I rubbed my knuckles into my eyes and, and then persuaded that it was Regent Street again. I became oddly muddled about some fantastic reminiscences that suddenly cropped up. Thirty years ago, I suddenly thought, I quarrelled with my brother just over there. <laughs> and then I burst out laughing. What? Thirty years ago, I didn't even exist. And I never had a brother. But, but somehow the, the, the poignant regret for that lost brother... It clung to me, and along Portland Road, the madness took another turn. I began to recall vanished shops, and, and to compare the street to, to what it was like decades ago. And now, confused, troubled thinking is comprehensible enough after the amount that I'd taken to drink. But you see, what puzzled me were, were these curiously vivid phantom memories that had had crept into my mind. And, and, and they hadn't only crept in, memories seemed to have slipped out too. I stopped opposite Stevens, the natural history dealers, and cudgelled my brains to think what the devil he ever had had to do with me. I mean, do, do they still show children dissolving views? Do, do you remember those in which one view would begin like a faint ghost and grow and gradually oust another one? Well, I mean, that's what it felt like then to me, that, that a, a ghostly set of new sensations were struggling with those of my, my ordinary self. I went on through Euston Road to Tottenham Court Road, puzzled, and I must admit, a little bit frightened. I turned into University Street and I couldn't remember the number of my house. It was only by the strongest effort that I recalled 11A. And even then it seemed to me that it was a thing that someone else had once told me. I tried to steady my mind by recalling the incidents of the dinner. And for the life of me, I couldn't conjure up no picture of my host's face. You know, I, I saw him only as, as a, a shadowy outline, as one might see oneself reflected in a window through which one is looking. But, but in his place, you see, I had a curious exterior vision of myself sitting at a table, flushed, bright-eyed and, and talkative. God, I must take this other powder, I said to myself. This is getting impossible. I took the wrong side of the hall for my candle and the matches and I had a doubt of which landing my room might be on. God, I am very drunk, I said, more loudly than I meant, and I, I stumbled needlessly on the staircase to prove the point. At first glance, when I got in, my room seemed unfamiliar. Oh, God, what is going on, I said, and I, I, I stared about me. I, I, now, this effort uh, seemed to bring me back to myself somewhat, and that the odd phantasmal quality passed into the concretely familiar. There, there was the old glass with my notes stuck in the corner of the frame, my old suit pitched about the floor. And yet, I felt an idiotic persuasion try to creep into my mind as if, as if I were in a railway carriage and my train was just pulling in and I was peering out of the window at some unknown station. It, 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 was, it was as if the picture of my present sensations was painted over some other picture that was trying to show through. Oh, God, cursed, I said. My, 
My wits are going. Half undressed, I, I tossed the powder Mr. Elversham had given me into a glass and drank it off in one. It had effervesced and become a fluorescent amber colour, and before I was in my bed, my mind already began to feel more tranquil. I felt the pillow at my cheek, and thereupon I think I must have fallen instantly to sleep. I awoke abruptly out of a dream of strange beasts and found myself lying on my back. You, you know, that dismal, emotional kind of dream which one escapes from awake, but, but strangely cowed. There, there was a curious taste in my mouth and a, a tired feeling in my limbs. I lay with my head motionless on the pillow, willing the feeling of strangeness to pass and staring with my eyes just above the bedclothes. First, I, I could perceive nothing wrong about me. There was the, the faintest of light only in the room and, and the furniture stood out in it as, as vague blots of absolute darkness. It came to my mind abruptly that someone had entered the room to rob me, but, but after lying there for some minutes pretending to sleep, I, I dismissed that as mere fancy. And yet, you see, the uneasy assurance of something wrong kept a fast hold. With an effort, I, I raised my head from the pillow and peered about at the dim shapes around me, the, the greater and lesser darknesses that indicated curtains, table, fireplace, bookshelves. And then I began to perceive something unfamiliar in the forms of the darkness. I, it, I, I, had the bed rotated somehow? I mean, yonder should be the bookshelves, and yet something shrouded and pallid rose there instead. Something that would not answer to bookshelves, however long I looked at it. I mean, it's too big to be my shirt thrown on a chair. Overcoming a childish terror, I threw back the bedclothes and thrust my leg out of bed, and instead of coming out of my truckle bed upon the floor, I found that my foot scarcely reached the edge of the mattress. I made another step, as it were, and sat up on the edge of the bed. Next to me should have been the candle and the matches on the broken chair, but I put out my hand and touched nothing. I waved my hand in the darkness, and it came against some heavy hanging, something thick and soft in texture. I grasped this and pulled, and it appeared to be a curtain suspended over the head of my bed. Well, I was by now thoroughly awake, and I began to realise that the room in which I had woken up was not my own. I tried to recall it the previous evening, and I found it now curiously vivid in my memory. The supper, the powders, my drunkenness, the, the coolness of my pillow and my flushed face. But oh, was that last night, or, or was that the night before? At any rate, the room that I was in now was strange to me. I, I, I could not imagine how I'd ever got into it. The dim, pallid outline was growing paler, and I saw now that it was a window with the dark shape of an oval toilet glass against the weak intimation of the dawn that filtered through the blind. I stood up, and I was surprised by a feeling of weakness and unsteadiness. Trembling and with hands outstretched, I walked towards the window and fumbled around the glass to find the blind cord. The blind ran up, and I found myself looking out upon a scene that was altogether new to me. The night was overcast, and, and through the heaped clouds, there filtered a faint half-light of dawn. Just at the edge of the sky, the cloud canopy had a blood-red rim. But below, everything was dark and indistinct. Dim hills in the distance. A vague mass of buildings running up into pinnacles. Trees like spilled ink. And below the window, a, a tracery of black bushes and pale grey paths. I mean, it, was, it was all so unfamiliar that for a moment I thought I must still be dreaming. I turned to the room again. Now that the blind was up, the faint spectres of its furnishings came out of the darkness. There was a, a huge curtained bed that I'd been lying in, and, and the fireplace at its foot had a large white mantle with something of the shimmer of marble about it. I, I leant against the toilet table, shut my eyes, and opened them again. I tried to think. I mean, the whole thing was far too real for, for dreaming, and I, I was inclined to imagine that there was 
some hiatus in my memory as a consequence of that strange liqueur I'd drunk. You know, that I had come in, into my inheritance perhaps already and suddenly lost recollection of everything since my good fortune had been announced. I mean, perhaps if I, if I waited a little, things would become clearer to me again. And yet, you see, my, my dinner with old Elvisham was singularly vivid and recent. You know, the, the champagne... The, the, the snooty waiters, the powder and the, the liqueurs. You know, I, I could have staked my soul. It had all happened a few hours ago. And then occurred a thing so trivial and yet so terrible that I shiver now to think about it. I spoke out loud. I said, how the devil did I get here? And the voice was not my own. It was not my voice. It was thin. The articulation slurred. The whole resonance of my facial bones was different. I ran one hand over the other and I felt loose folds of skin. It's the, the bony laxity of old age. Surely, I said in that horrible voice that had somehow established itself in my throat, surely this is all a terrible dream and Almost as quickly as if I did it involuntarily, I thrust my fingers into my mouth and... Ah! Ah! My teeth had gone! My teeth had gone! My fingertips ran over the flaccid surface of a, an even row of shriveled gums. I tottered to the mantel and felt along it for matches, and as I did so, a barking cough sprang up into my throat. I clutched the thick flannel nightdress I found about me. The, there were no matches, and suddenly I realised how old I was. Sniffing and coughing, I, I fumbled back to bed. It's a dream, I whispered to myself as I clambered back in. It, it must be a dream. I, I pulled the bedclothes over my ears, and I thrust my withered hand under the pillow, determined to sleep. Of course it was a dream. In the morning it would be over, and I would wake up strong and vigorous again to my youth and my medical studies. But it wouldn't come. Sleep wouldn't come. And the conviction of the inexorable reality of the change that happened to me grew steadily. Presently I found myself, with eyes wide open, and my skinny fingers once more upon my shriveled gums. I was suddenly and abruptly an old man. I had in some unaccountable manner fallen through my life and come straight to old age. In some way I had been cheated of the best of my life, of love of struggle, of strength, of hope. I groveled into the pillow and tried to persuade myself that it was impossible. And imperceptibly, steadily, the dawn grew clearer until a chill twilight rendered the whole chamber visible. It was a more spacious and better furnished than any room that I've ever slept in before. A candle and matches now became dimly visible on a little pedestal in a recess. I threw back the bedclothes and, shivering with the rawness of the early morning, I got out and lit the candle. Then, trembling horribly, I tottered to the glass and saw... You will have already guessed. The face of Mr Elvisham. The had already seemed physically weak and pitiful to me, but seen now, dressed in a coarse flannel nightdress that fell apart and showed a stringy neck, seen now as my own body, I cannot describe its desolate decrepitude. The hollow cheeks, the straggling tail of dirty grey hair, the roomy bleared eyes, the quivering shriveled lips, the lower displaying a gleam of the pink interior lining, those horrible, ghastly, dark gums. I'd been changed. I'd been in some way transfigured, although how the thing had been done, I, 
could not begin to imagine. It was fully daylight before I gathered myself sufficiently to think. And as I thought, the diabolical ingenuity of Elvisham came home to me. It seemed plain to me that as I found myself in his, so he must be in possession of my body, my strength, my future. God, my mind reeled and I had to pinch myself, I had to feel again like toothless gums, I had to look at myself in the glass before I could steady myself to face God. I mean, it was my life all a hallucination? Was I Elvisham and he me, or had I simply been dreaming of Edward Eden overnight? Was there any Edward Eden? But, but if I was Elvisham, I should remember where I was on the previous morning. I should remember the name of the town in which I lived, what had happened before this terrible dream began. I struggled with my thoughts, but not the ghost of many memories, but those proper to Edward Eden could I raise. I staggered to my feet. I dragged my feeble limbs to the washstand and plunged my dry grey head into a basin of cold water. And then, toweling myself, I tried to think again. But it was no good. I, I, I felt beyond all question that I was Eden. I was not Elvisham, but I was in Elvisham's body. Had I been a man of any other era, I would have diagnosed enchantment witchcraft, but here was some trick of psychology, surely. Well, what a drug and a steady stare could do, a drug and a steady stare could surely undo. Men have lost their memories before, I told myself, but to exchange memories as, as one exchanges umbrellas. <laughs> I laughed out loud, but it was a horrible, wheezing, senile titter. And then I fancied old Elvisham laughing at my plight, and a gust of anger swept over me. I opened the wardrobe, and I found some clothes, and coughing for my exertions, I, I tottered out into the landing. It was, it was then perhaps a quarter to six. The blinds were closely drawn, and the house was quite silent. A broad richly carpeted staircase went down into the darkness of the hall below and before me an open door showed a writing desk, the back of a chair and a fine array of bound books. My study, I mumbled, and I walked towards the landing. The, 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 the drawers of the writing desk were locked, its revolving top was locked also, but I could see no indication of keys and there were none in the, the pockets of my trousers. So I, I shuffled at once back to the bedroom and I went through the pockets of every garment that I could find. And not only were there no keys to be found, there was not a single coin or scrap of paper. There was nothing but the bill of last night's dinner. A curious weariness asserted itself as I began to realise the immense intelligence of my enemy's plans and to see more and more the utter hopelessness of my position. With an effort, I rose and hobbled into the study again. On the staircase, a housemaid was pulling up the blinds and she stared at me strangely as I walked past her. I shut the door of the study behind me and seizing a poker, I began a violent attack upon the desk. And that is how they found me. The cover of the desk split, the lock smashed, the letters torn out of the pigeonholes and tossed about the room. In my senile rage, I'd flung about the pens and overturned the ink, but I could find no checkbook, no money, no indications of the slightest use for the recovery of my own body. I was battering madly at the drawers when the butler and two women servants came in. And that is the story of my change. No one will believe my frantic assertions. I am treated as one demented. And even at this moment I'm under restraint. But I am sane. I'm absolutely sane. And to prove it, 
I have sat down to write this story minutely as the things happen to me. And I ask you now, be honest, is there any trait of insanity in the style or method of my story? I am a young man locked away in an old man's body. Naturally, I appear demented to those who will not believe this. Naturally, I don't know the names of my secretaries or the doctors who come to see me or my servants and neighbours or this town where it is that I find myself. Naturally, I lose myself in this enormous house. Naturally, I ask odd questions. Naturally, I weep and cry out and have paroxysms of despair. I've no money and no checkbook. The bank will not recognise my signature because I suppose that allowing for the feeble muscles I now have, my handwriting is still Edward Eden's. It seems that Elversham kept the name of his solicitor secret from his household and I can ascertain nothing from them. Elsham was, of course, a profound student of mental science, and all my declarations of the facts of the case merely confirm the doctor's theory that my insanity is the outcome of overmuch brooding upon psychology. Two days ago, I was a healthy youngster with all my life before me, and now I am a furious old man, untempt, and desperate and miserable, prowling about a great, luxurious, strange house, watched, feared and avoided as a lunatic by everybody about me, and in the middle of London, Elsham is beginning his life again, in a vigorous, strong body with all the accumulated knowledge and wisdom of three score years and ten. He's stolen my life. He's stolen my life. What, what has happened, I do not clearly know. You know. In the study, there are volumes of manuscript notes referring chiefly to the psychology of memory and parts of what may either be calculations or ciphers in symbols absolutely beyond my comprehension. In some passages, there are indications that he was also occupied with the philosophy of mathematics. I take it that he has somehow transferred the whole of his memories, everything that makes up his personality from his withered old brain to mine. And similarly that he has transferred mine to his discarded tenement. Practically, that is, he has changed bodies. But how such a change is possible? I, I, you know, I, I've been a materialist all of my thinking life, but here suddenly is a clear case of man's detachability from matter. One desperate experiment I'm about to try. I sit writing here before putting the matter to issue. This morning, with the help of a table knife that I'd secreted at breakfast, I succeeded in breaking open a fairly obvious secret drawer in this erect writing desk. I discovered nothing but a little green glass file containing a white powder, round the neck of which was a label on which was written this one word. Release. Now this release may be, it most probably is poison. I can understand. Elvisham placing poison in my way, and I should be sure that that was his intention to get rid of the only living witness against him, were it not for this careful concealment. I mean, the, the, the man has practically solved the problem of immortality. I would say for the spite of chance, he will live in my body until it has aged, and then again, throwing that aside, he will assume some other victims youth and strength i mean when one remembers his heartlessness it is terrible to think of the ever growing oh god how long how long has he been leaping from body to body it's too much and i tire of writing 
The powder appears to be soluble in water. The taste is not unpleasant. And there, the strange narrative found upon Mr. Elversham's desk ends. His dead body lay between the desk and the chair. The latter had been pushed back, probably, in his last convulsions. The story was written in pencil, in a crazy hand, quite unlike his usual careful characters. There remain only two curious facts to record. Indisputably, there was some connection between Eden and Elvisham because the whole of Elvisham's property was indeed bequeathed to the young man. But he never inherited. When Elvisham committed suicide, Eden was, strangely enough, already dead. 24 hours before, he'd been knocked down by a cab and killed instantly at the crowded crossing at the intersection of Gower Street and Euston Road. So the only human being who could have ever thrown light upon the fantastic narrative that I've just presented with you is now beyond the reach of questions. Well, without further comment, I, I leave this extraordinary matter to your individual judgment. <laughs>